Hi, Lorraine. Welcome to the show. Hi, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to chat. Okay, so introduce who you are, what you do, and maybe an interesting fact that we wouldn't find on your resume. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm Lorraine. I am the founder of Rise Learning Solutions, where I am a speaker and a trainer. I'm a consultant and also an instructor with LinkedIn Learning and Stanford Continuing Studies. And before that, I spent the first 10 years of my career as a founding editor at tech companies like LinkedIn and Prezi. And now I work with organizations and teams to teach them how to supercharge their professional presence. And a fun fact, not on my resume. Well, this is on my LinkedIn profile, but just in the about. <laughs> uh, um, I do Muay Thai for fun and as a as a workout, not to compete at all, but just you know something different. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's so cool. I yeah. I've never met anyone who does that. But I see. Uh, is this? I think I see people doing this in the park. Do you do this outside? Um, I used to during COVID. Now I go to a gym, but yeah, people are probably doing like kickboxing or Muay Thai. Some form yeah, of that. yeah. I live by like a big park, and I swear, I'm like the people who have started the classes over there for stuff. I'm like so smart because you're not paying to like rent a space. Yeah. And yes, I see it. Um, that's very cool. Um, okay, so you talked about the fact that you teach people professional presence. I, I guess let's start with just a basic understanding of like. What is professional presence? It's kind of, I feel like a buzzword we hear a lot, but what does that mean? Yeah, so professional presence to me is twofold. So I think um, there's a typical definition. So how others perceive me, for example, so Lauren, like, you know, do you see me as confident, personable, charismatic? Do I have gravitas? All of those things. But there's really another side to presence that I don't think is being talked about very much, um, but it's just equally as important, right? So presence in terms of how others perceive you, but also presence in terms of where others see you. So today, especially, you know, so many of us are online or in hybrid uh, situations. We need to make sure that we're being really intentional with all those touch points we have in a given day where we might not be face to face, but you are forming impressions about me. And I am, you know, I want to make sure I'm representing myself as I want to be represented in those moments. So again, all those various touch points throughout the day, um, especially virtually, is it representing me accurately as a professional? Does it build my credibility in your eyes? Um, so are you on platforms like LinkedIn, for example? Um, and so both the how and the where, I think are really critical if you want to excel in your career. Can you give us an example? So, I mean, the obvious one is being on LinkedIn, but what about like a less obvious more just like within your work example. So let's let's leave the social media platforms out of it. Sure, sure. Yeah. So there's a lot of different uh, places. So in like a Slack channel, for example, like we all have our profiles, right? And a lot of people will leave their little um, profile picture empty. But that's a really great opportunity to have your picture there. So people register, okay, I'm talking to Lauren. This is yeah. what it looks like versus she's like this ambiguous like outline of a of, like a gray figure right <laughs> yeah so with, like zoom calls like profile picture there right like if your video is off much rather have a profile picture of you where i feel like i at least am talking to a person versus sort of a, a vague blank image like yeah. email signatures like mine is very robust like you know don't just put your name but it's like your title um where can people learn more about you did you work on a report, a content marketing piece that you want people to be aware of. So um, those are just a few examples of where you can really enhance. And these are, you know, we're chatting and emailing all day. Like so many people see that. And that's a place where you can really shine and differentiate yourself. Yeah, I love those examples. And they're really easy. Like they're quick things that anyone can do is have the, have the profile photos, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, we're going to be talking about just how to level up communication skills in general. One of the places that presentation or communication skills come very much to the forefront is when you're giving a presentation. Yeah. So can you define what makes a good presentation versus a not so good presentation? And let's break it down by both virtual and in person for because there's sure. a variety of types of work right now. Yeah. So I think, you know, regardless of whether you're online or in person presenting, I do think a strong presentation has a few very like key elements, universal things that make something good. So um, the first one that comes to mind is structure. 
right? So making sure you have some sort of flow and plan <laughs> for how you're presenting the content. You know, a lot of people, we remember thing, things in groups of three. So like whenever I give like keynote talks or trainings, it's like three, three, three. Um, visuals are super important, right? We, we um, process visuals faster and remember them longer than we do text and also avoids the issue of people reading like what's on the screen when you're talking. So, you know, I'm always a very big proponent of visuals in your presentations. And then you also, you know, beyond the presentation and content itself, you also need to be a strong presenter. Uh, so your content can be good, but if you haven't practiced and prepared and really gotten that feedback, um, it's going to hurt the, the content piece of your presentation. So I would just lay those out as initially what comes to mind is, you know, very universal concrete things. Uh, from a virtual perspective, uh, I talk a lot about virtual uh, because it was a bit of a shift. I think a lot of people did kind of think, okay, I'm going to take what I did in person and just yeah. port it over to a virtual world, but it doesn't, you know, it didn't, didn't work so well. <laughs> um, so, so some things you really want to consider, you know, especially in a virtual space, things like adding more movement to your presentations. So when we add movement to presentations it gives our brains a little bit of a dopamine hit and it's just like oh like okay like i'm paying close attention now i think a lot of people a mistake they make both virtually and in person is they will talk about a slide and like all the text will be up there and it'll just they'll be talking for like 10 minutes but our brains really need to constantly be activated and be seeing new things so movement is really key virtually where it is easier to be a little bit disengaged and distracted with things going on um, similarly, like state changes, um, I always like to say, are really good things. They're also called pattern interrupts. So making sure that you change the state of things. So launching a poll, asking a question, doing a breakout activity, asking people to brainstorm something, write something down. Um, that's really important for virtual. And then also the visuals as well. Um, something I would say is similar. You need good body language for both, but in person, you need to be, you know, you're commanding a room. So probably yeah. your energy needs to be a little bit bigger. There needs to be more physical movements um, of your body across the room and different things like eye contact with like different members of the audience, making sure you're projecting. Um, virtually, it's going to be a little bit different where, you know, you're probably just looking straight ahead at the camera. Right. Feel like you know everyone feels like you're looking at them but you're just looking in one direction. So um, some overlap and then some different things and tweaks we have to make. Yeah, no, those are really good tips. And I'm curious too, I mean, I agree with like kind of structure. And I also think when you know you have a really good presentation, you're also more confident in presenting Absolutely. it. So similar to a lot of things in life, like the prep work you put into it is what makes the, the end result so good. Are there tools that you really like? I know you used to work at Prezi, but like a lot of people are in PowerPoint land. Like is there, are, what, I guess, besides PowerPoint, what are the other tools that really help you? Like if you're not a graphic designer, but you want to create a graph or you want to have, you know, you know, changing the state of things or whatnot, what, what do you love? Yeah. So I would say, I mean, I think PowerPoint can do a lot more than it did in the yeah. old days or what, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> But the thing is, is a lot of people are not using those features. Yeah, that's they're where the like problem in the is, learning so. curve where they're like, I don't want to have to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I do think PowerPoint can be pretty robust. You just have to kind of actually take the time to learn it. Um, Canva is like a really popular tool that I have used before, and they have a lot of nice templates. Prezi, as you mentioned, I, I use Prezi for all my talks, um, both for virtual and in person. Um, so I would say there's a lot of free platforms out there that have templates and people who create things that you can, you know, copy and paste. Uh, and use for your own use case. So um, I think, yeah, I think just the fact that you're even thinking about, okay, I want to make this visually appealing, like you're already a step ahead of so many people. And one other thing I mentioned before, visuals are really important. Like you don't necessarily need to have the nicest design, but I think having surprising visuals or strong visuals that really represent what you are trying to convey can be a fun thing. So for example, my virtual presentations talking about video presence and creating more engaging presentations, I have like a big race car at the bottom of the screen. And so that I don't need to have text talking about, it's about talking about the importance of movement, um, but I don't need to have like a lot of text about why movement is important, but just having like the big red sports car can be a nice way to, you know, I don't have to be a super good designer. I just need to be able to prop it out. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's many, again, many tools out there that do that for free and then have that be kind of the main focal point of my slide. 
Yeah, I remember I went to someone's presentation the other day and she was giving, um, she's basically telling a story about people who like did great things, but they weren't always the best at it. And she showed a picture of Martin Luther King's report card and he got A's and like A's and B's and everything except public speaking where he got like a C or a D. And okay. so, you know, it was like a really good yeah. visual of like, you obviously know he was a really good public yeah. speaker, you know, like, so yeah. anyway, it, it like added to her story and she, yeah. she told like a lot of really good stories, but I like, I still remember that perfectly. Um, so I, I totally see your point of like, sometimes you're not necessarily having to design it either. Um, okay. I want to talk about presentation skills. Give us some tactical advice for becoming a better presenter. Where do we start? And maybe like, you know, why present like why it is nerve wracking to present or publicly speak, at, especially at work. I mean, I feel like I think virtual has helped a little bit, at least for me, it takes the nerves yeah. off a little bit. But at um, the same time, you know, you you want to have people leave your meeting being like, that was a good meeting or you did a great job with that. Or I know I have like a lot of clarity on what it is that you're getting through. Um, So talk about like just being a better presenter. Where do we start with that? Yeah, uh, maybe I'll address the nerves piece that you mentioned first, and then I'll go into some of the tips. So, yes, getting nervous before presenting is totally normal. And I mean, this is a big part of my job and I still get nervous. So I just always like to just give that as kind of a baseline that if you are feeling nervous, just to not be too hard on yourself. Right. Like I work with a lot of keynote speakers. I know a lot of keynote speakers, too, and they still get nervous and a little bit anxious before you know getting on stage or getting on camera. So I just like to level set that that is normal. Um, I think maybe what the difference is between a professional speaker, someone who does this a little bit more regularly versus someone who still feels super nervous is channeling that nervous energy and turning it into excitement and like really turning it into a positive thing. Like, okay, wow, I'm kind of nervous, but okay, it's making me more alert and I'm more focused. And, you know, so a lot of good things can come from nerves. It's about reframing and our body actually reacts the same way to nerves and excitement. It's just the story we tell. Yeah, I've heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. kind of impacts like how we're feeling about it. So I'm um, just level setting that there uh, in terms of the nerves and then understanding that it is like a flight, fight or freeze, you know, reaction. Like it's very primitive primal like in terms of what you know how our body reacts to this scary thing of people judging us and so again just wanted to to put that out there as just a normal thing um so it is it can be like overwhelming as, as you mentioned so there's actually three especially for virtual there's three tips that i like to share a framework that i came up with called the t method and so t stands for tech energy and aesthetics and i specifically came up with this because people do get overwhelmed and nervous and it's like where do I start there's so many things I yeah can do. Uh, so I try to create this framework to just really simplify it so the tech piece making sure you have the essential technology you need especially virtually um, but also in person right like you have like your presentation and the clicker and all that but just making sure you have the right tech pieces your camera your microphone things like that um, so that you are of course making the best impression possible and making sure you have the right software as well that is going to enhance your presentation um, the E for energy, so making sure that you are using body language and hand gestures to emphasize points and just show that you are engaged with your audience um, is really key. Making sure you're starting off on the right note. So many presentations, both in person and virtually, people start off with, hi, you know, I'm Lorraine and I'm here to talk about this today and we're going to, you know, it's just like so expected. So to yeah. start off with something different, something unexpected, again, like triggers that dopamine and causes people to pay more give attention. me an example i'm so curious like what yeah. yeah so like all my keynotes like i'll usually just start off with a question or a scenario so i'll be like imagine leading meetings where people are actually excited to attend and then that kind of triggers oh that would be amazing like, yeah i, I want to i'm gonna that. learn something like interesting here or um like when i talk about any topic really i might say what is a challenge that you're facing right now and what do you hope to get out of this session today. And that gets people in the mindset of, okay, I need to like engage right away, or let me think about what my goals are um, so I can really be like tuned into what's going on. Um, so those are just, you know, little, little yeah, tweaks like that. That, make that go a long way. Yeah, and, and it's really setting the expectation that this is not gonna be, you know, your typical boring uh, presentation. Yeah, so. talk at you the whole time. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, Okay, and then go over the A, you said. The A, yes, the A is aesthetic. So um, virtually you're gonna wanna make sure you have the right framing, um, that you have a curated 
background or I actually say curated environment because sometimes you can virtually put stuff on the screen. Um, you want to make sure you're wearing the right clothing and, you know, same in person. You want to make sure that you're showing up with the right kind of outfit and clothes and, you know, the, the way that you want to be seen and just making sure that you are coming across the way that you want to. So, yeah, my thing uh, is that I have a couple red suits that I really like. And so I always wear like nice. a red suit and like again, or that. like a red top. And it's funny because yeah. people are like, but career contest is teal. I can tell you teal is like a really hard color to go out and buy. There's less of it around. So <laughs> yeah. I went with red and like my book was red. So I feel like it was justified. But um, I, I like that because it's like a really small thing, but like, yeah, if you, if you were to watch review or like uh, a bunch of video clips of me talking um, mm -hmm. from the talk or giving, you know, giving keynotes or whatnot, you would, you would notice that, you know, and talk about it's part of my like professional presence a little bit, you know? Yeah, so um, exactly. yeah, like these, it's, it's funny because it's like a lot of these little things add up. Like, it's not just one thing. It's like, it, it, you know, it's not just the presentation, it's how you present it, you know, it's your body language, it's how you start it, you know, those little things for sure. Um, yeah. but I really like that framework. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And that's like, it, you're totally right with that. It's just, it's kind of like building trust, right? It's like little actions that kind of build up over time. And then this is like little actions that really are contributing to your presence and just, um, you know, showing people that like you want to engage them and you're like all these little things add up to really make that big, like, wow impression. Yeah. Okay. I want to switch gears just about, you know, communicating with executives. So or like stakeholders. It doesn't mean like, you know, that oftentimes at work, you're asked to work with other people, uh, collaborate with others. Maybe you need to go talk to that executive, present in front yeah. of them. Communication tips with <laughs> working with others or trying yeah. to get across your, you know, like get what you want, obviously with stakeholders. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of things that uh, you can do <laughs> yeah. to, be doing to kind of facilitate that. So there's one thing I like to talk about very often. Um, it's called a README or a personal operating manual. Have you heard of those before? Yeah, I love these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I always like to uh, talk about these when I'm talking about like collaboration and building trust in workplaces. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, it is essentially a document. It can be as shorter as long as you would like it to be. And it's a document outlining your way of working, how you like to communicate, how you like to give and receive feedback, uh, anything you want really in it. But obviously communication is an important piece that I definitely think should be included. And so I think these are really powerful, especially for cross-functional stakeholders to help make communication smooth because everyone has has different preferences. Like I might, Lauren, really like getting emails because I'm more introverted. And so I like to read and just process, but you might be someone who's like, just talk to me in person. Like, I, you know, I'm not going to process what you're, if you send me yeah. a long email, you know? So just like making it very clear how you like to work and how you best work, I think is really key to opening those lines of communication just making sure everything is as smooth as possible, because especially in virtual distributed hybrid formats, there's just so many channels that you can be using and things get lost. And so as much as you can try to cater to that person, what works best for them and, and them to you as well, uh, I think that really helps a lot with communication. I also really like when teams kind of set the expectations, like if it's urgent, yeah. you send a text or, you know, we use Slack yes. for ongoing communication, but we don't yeah. put assignments in there or send important documents like those yeah. go through, I don't know, your project management tool or your email yeah. or something like that. What do you see as some of the biggest communication gaps at work and like where, where things start to break down for people? Yeah, that's a good question. I think communication gaps, one, not understand, again, what we just said, like not understanding how people like to communicate. I think there is an assumption that, okay, I'm communicating something with you and you're going to catch it. And something I learned, especially in our virtual world, and um, my former CEO used to always say this, you need to repeat things seven different times in seven different ways, uh, maybe in seven different channels, I don't know exactly where, but you need to repeat yourself and not assume that just because you have sent out an update once that everyone is going to catch it. And so just yeah. being aware that there are just so many more distractions and there is just so much more going on, as you say. Um, so to be able to understand that you need to repeat yourself um, for messages to really stick is important. It's not just like a one and done deal, at least in this way of working now. Um, yeah. It's like over communication is the new, just like normal way yes. to communicate. And, and yes. like, I feel this way sometimes in like marketing, right? It's like, 
actually, you don't have to reinvent what you're saying. You can yeah. keep saying the same thing over and over again. And like, actually, yes. it's really good for personal branding. Like you are the yes. person for that thing. So yeah, yeah, I think it's like, you're so self-aware of what you're doing, what you're saying, and you're almost like sensitive to doing it too much. But for a lot of people, they're like, oh, no, actually, on the fourth yeah. time, it finally stuck. It's a good thing you did it four times. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I've never heard someone complain that someone else over communicates. It's always an issue. Yeah. For communicating my over communicating I'm like great like if I already know what you are telling me I'm like great thanks for like the reminder thanks for you know telling me again and I love when people over communicate um, same I've never heard someone say I hate it yeah, yeah no it's yeah. a really good point okay Lorraine before we wrap up I want to talk to you about LinkedIn because you yes. have you are a top voice on LinkedIn you have a whole huge brand on there so talk about your love for LinkedIn, why you use it, how it's benefited your career. I mean, many people listening to this podcast probably have a LinkedIn profile, but like any yeah. tips for sort of like optimizing that obvious besides the obvious things of like, make sure you have a profile photo, like what else can you do to like optimize that experience? Yeah. So, um, I am, was a founding editor at LinkedIn. So I worked there for six years, wonderful experience. And while I was at LinkedIn, I would just post often about the content I was creating on behalf of the team. And it was really only when I switched jobs, I actually took a little bit of a hiatus because I was like, I don't know what I should be posting about and not yeah. having working at LinkedIn anymore. So it was really, you know, switching jobs and, and doing more of the public speaking where I started posting more and realizing or re-remembering maybe, um, you know, how powerful the platform is. And it was a good reminder that LinkedIn is such a powerful tool for us to represent our brands, our career brands, our personal brands, and that it should not always be tied to the company. Um, it's been yeah. like my, having worked at LinkedIn, and of course, I need to talk about LinkedIn things, but yeah, you know, I, I really saw the power of LinkedIn as I started doing this and posting and people would reach out to me for additional opportunities. And this is still while I was working at my corporate gig, right? So mm -hmm. um, having those opportunities also still helped me with my full time job. And then it helped me as well once I, you know, I got laid off in November 2022 and had to decide, okay, do I turn this side hustle into my full time job? And LinkedIn really was a big piece in giving me that confidence that, oh, I have built a brand for myself and people do know me for, you know, certain topics and things like that. Let me give it a try and see what can come of it. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to optimizing your presence, of course, the profiles, the foundational piece, I like to call it uh, your virtual landing page. And there's always this, this stat I love sharing uh, that 82% of buyers will look up a seller on LinkedIn before replying to prospecting efforts. And we're not all sellers, but I think we've all had yeah. that experience where like someone will reach out and we're like, mm, this kind of seems intriguing, but who is this person? Is this? Yeah. Smart? Like, are they legit? legit? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we go to their LinkedIn to, to assess. And so of course, you know, all the foundational pieces of the profile are key. Um, I would also encourage people to really start creating content to really elevate to the next Next level and creating content does not need to mean you are a content creator and an aspiring influencer and creating posts every day it can be something as simple as and i always like to actually suggest this first commenting on other people's posts yeah people i love that too find interesting um it is creating content through comments it's a little less scary than just putting your you know your own posts out there and it's such a wonderful way to make connections like i know lauren we got introduced through someone but i feel like you got tagged in something of my post so we would have met anyway through LinkedIn. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just like a wonderful way for people to connect and for you to meet new people who will open yeah. doors and opportunities that you wouldn't even have thought for yourself. Well, and also people might not know this, but on LinkedIn, you can click on activity and like, I can see where like Lorraine's been leaving comments too. So yeah. it's like great networking. Cause if you want to build a relationship with Lorraine, yeah. You could go reply to her comments on other people's things or like see where she yeah. who she follows. Um, also, to your point about creating content, your content creation sh could just be that you're really active in adding your two cents to what other people oh. are sharing and it shows up under your profile. Um, I know I've been creating content on LinkedIn. It was sort of my challenge to do it every day for like six months. And I will say I'm like, I'm like yeah, this, this is a lot, you know, um, yeah. like sometimes the ideas are flowing, sometimes they're not. And, but also, you know, to your point about like, even when you worked in corporate, it was really important for you to have that personal brand there. And kind of, I, I think uh, like the, the best combinations when you can sort of combine what you're doing in corporate with yeah. the LinkedIn personal mm -hmm. brand. Um, which is why, look, it's like if you worked in finance, but you have a deep desire in social media, it's like maybe go do finance for a social media company. And then you have, you know, it, it's like the storyline makes a little bit more sense. It's not to say that you can't do complete opposite things or whatnot, but um, 
I'm just saying, I think that's when you like see the most natural combination and fit happening on LinkedIn. Um, no, I, I agree with you. I had a whole, we had a whole episode on how to add um, value comments on LinkedIn and like kind of the importance of it. And I think it's a really nice, easy way to kind of dip your toes into LinkedIn networking. Um, and certainly LinkedIn is having its like creator moment for sure. Um, okay. So final thoughts on how to level up your communication skills at work, any resources or books or things that, I mean, like, let's say someone's been getting performance reviews where they're being told like your communication skills are not the best or some sort of cousin of communication, right? There's all these like types of communication at work. Um, where, what, where would you point someone to, or what would you say for them to do? Yeah. Well, hopefully this is not too promotional, but I have many free LinkedIn learning courses. <laughs> No, not for me, like free. So we'll yeah. put those in the show notes. <laughs> On topics like communicating with executives, giving and receiving feedback, uh, you know, speaking up so others uh, will listen. So uh, I have uh, 14 courses out now. 13 are free and under 10 minutes each. So I encourage you to check those out. You can uh, find them at LorraineKaylee.com slash LinkedIn Learning. Amazing. We'll put those in the show notes. And I know even at Career Contessa, we have... Um, we partnered with Molly and Liz and we have this like free communication guide to working with me. So I'll put that in the show notes too, because that's basically what Lorraine was talking about. It's like, how does Lorraine like to communicate? How do I like to communicate? And sometimes it might feel weird if you're doing it in a brand new job, like on day one of being there. But like yeah. I would, but if you've been there for a while, work this into your process to your team. Um, and I think it shows a lot of initiative of like, yeah. Hey, maybe we're an organized team, but we can always get better. Or, Hey, like no one's ever asked these questions. And I think it's important to be proactive with that. So I think that's great. Um, Lorraine, where else can people or like share where people can find you? You mentioned yeah. your website, which we'll put in the show notes. Um, where else? Yeah. So you can also uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to hear your thoughts on the show and just connect with you there. And uh, so you can send me a connection request there. And then also I have a weekly free newsletter, bite-sized tips to supercharge your career in three minutes or less. So uh, I think Lauren, you'll drop that in the uh, yep, description as well. So you can subscribe and uh, get content, more content from me there. Yeah, we love it. Okay. Thank you, Lorraine. This has been so, so helpful. Thank you so much.